because we're going to make sure we've done everything we can do to help you be successful when you face NCLEX. And most importantly, when you take care of a patient later, okay? So make sure you've looked at that. Um, and we will go from there. So this one, I will, let me make my notes to self today. Um, Mr. Money, if you'll remind me, I don't remember where you said you were sitting. There you are. <laughs> if you will remind me to open up their ATI for Module B today. Um, I'll open up your Module B assignments today, okay? As it, and once again, I'm gonna say this because things happen. If for whatever reason, now, you know, give me till the end of the day. Don't, don't look at it at 11.30 and say, it's not nothing. At the end of the day today, if you can't see it, you can, you can send me a remind. This is that one exception. We'll let you use remind for so that you can let me know, hey, Dr. Bose, I can't see it, and I'll go back and fix it again, okay? But we'll make sure that you have access to it, okay? Um, module G is kind of an odd module to be in our content. But it's kind of a breath of fresh yeah, I think you'll find it a breath of fresh air, okay? It's not near as complex in regards to pathophysiology. Um, you still have pharmacology on here as you would with the ADO's module, but I don't think you'll find this difficult content. I know that you had time to listen to the Camtasia before the module C test. Not. <laughs> I know Jay told me he said he He's going to do it. <laughs> no, I get I it. Okay. We were students too, and, and we, we understand. Okay. So, um, but I do expect you between now and the next class meeting that you have done that. Okay. It's an hour and 35 minutes. It is very well constructed. Ms. Lay is my mentee. I'm her mentor as a new faculty member, which she's not new anymore. She's been here a few years now. But one of the things she was tasked with was reorganizing this content. I wasn't happy with it, I didn't like it, and I wanted her to restructure it, and she did a above and beyond excellent job on it. So I, that recording is in there. Um, and, she, and again, she'll, she does an excellent job teaching through it. So make sure you take notes while you're listening to it. I wouldn't sit there and listen for an hour and 35 minutes straight, unless you're so intrigued and you're eating popcorn and you're good to go. But I would take breaks. I'd do about 20 minute segments or wait when she changes subject matter and go take a break and come back. Because remember we talked about how the brain works, right? And you can't, come, you can't defeat the brain. It's, it's going to defeat you. So you have to work with how your brain learns and accept how that process takes place. And then you'll find that you'll be a much better learner, much more effective, okay? So I would do it in snippets. But make sure you do it between now and then because when, before module, let's see, today's Tuesday, before Thursday, in addition to that, I want you to have reviewed normal anatomy and physiology for the pulmonary system. Don't forget, there's a vascular component that goes along with the gas component. And you have to have reviewed both, okay? Or, or what we talk about is not going to make any sense to you, okay? So questions before we get started on module G. There are module G questions on your module B test. Okay, now it's obviously not heavily weighted. There's not a lot of it on there, but there's enough that would affect a letter grade. So make sure you've reviewed it, okay? This should be, again, that breath of fresh air content that you're like, ooh, I like this. This is pretty good stuff. All right, so um, you're gonna find that I'm gonna glean over some of these things. What does the prefix mal indicate to you? Bad, negative, not good, whatever adjective we wanna use, we know if we see the word mal, Something's not right. So we say maltreatment, we're saying poor treatment, bad treatment, right? When you're taking NCLEX, guys, don't let words intimidate you. Take them apart. Look at the prefix, look at the suffix, look at the root, and you'll be able to make sense of something that you may have not ever heard before, okay? The maltreatment. Now, we say here intentional, but I'm going to give you some examples of when it can be unintentional. But we're talking about intentional abuse or neglect. Is there a difference between abuse and neglect? Yes. Yeah, both are considered poor treatment, aren't they? Yes. Okay. So what would be an example that a school nurse might go forward with that's, that would say or demonstrate that this child is being neglected? What would be something a school nurse would assess? Poor, 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 
part not properly clothed, poor hygiene, what else? Okay, that's going to go to abuse versus neglect. So on, no, no, please. I was going to say like a low BMI. Okay, maybe they're very malnourished or could it be the other end of the spectrum? Okay, so we're looking at neglectful. What about a, a child who doesn't have their visual aids? Is that neglect? Yes. They need glasses, they don't have them. Um, they need hearing aids, they don't have them. Okay? They need resources, they don't have them. This is the child that comes to school, never has lunch money. Parents don't take the time to fill out the lunch forms where they get subsidized lunches. Somebody's got to feed the baby, right? Okay, so we've got some situations of some neglect that a parent, uh, school nurse might say, mm, I need to investigate this. What would be now some symptoms of abuse, Quan? Bruising. bruising. In places I wouldn't expect to see bruising. Characteristics of a bruise that would be inconsistent with how the child said they injured themselves, right? What else? How would the child act in your classroom? Withdrawn. Okay, there's two different types of behavior, and they're typically associated with two different types of abuse. The physically abused child will act how? They'll act out. The only way this child has ever earned attention from their parents is by acting out. And even though the consequence of that is the abuse, and again, sometimes they don't act out and they get abused, okay? Don't make that misunderstanding, but the child has learned to associate abuse with attention. I mean, excuse me, their behavior and getting attention, albeit the negative attention is what they get. Whereas your sexually abused child is typically your withdrawn, okay? Now that doesn't mean that if I have a withdrawn child, I'm gonna assume that they're being sexually abused. Okay, remember we said, I have that old saying, don't put blankets on people. Okay, my mother, I was raised Roman Catholic. My mother is diehard Roman Catholic to this day, but she will tell you first and foremost that she didn't care if the Pope gave her permission or not. She was taking birth control to save a baby. She said they're not raising my children either. Okay, so don't put blankets on people. Just because they are of a different group or a cultural group or different things, we don't say they're all that way. Remember in nursing school, we teach you on NCLEX exams. If you see the words all, every, never, that's not the correct option. Because people aren't that way. Okay? So we've got some abuse and we've got some neglect. Now, I said I was going to give you an example of unintentional. There was a, a lady, I haven't seen her in a long time at, at Walmart, probably because I haven't gone to Walmart in a while. Um, she was clearly a victim of fetal alcohol syndrome. Do you all know what I mean? What that is? What is that? The mother ingested excessive amounts of alcohol while she was carrying the person. Okay? and the person grows to have characteristics of fetal alcohol syndrome. And when you see these people as adults or children, they have very specific facial characteristics that you can identify and you can say, this person is most likely a person who has fetal alcohol syndrome, okay? Characteristics that are similar to what um, a Down syndrome child looks like, similar but not quite the same, okay? They have the wide berth between the eyes, some other things, and then, you know, one of my questions that I have later for my, my God, I'm not pushing my beliefs on you, but you believe what you want to. I want to know what this is for. It's called a philtrum, these little divots. I want to know what it's for. It's supposed to catch rainwater? I mean, what does it do? Don't you want to know? I'm a nerd like that. I want to know what is the purpose of this. Anyway, fetal alcohol syndrome people don't have that. It's flat. So it's one of the first things you'll notice is they don't have that, okay? Um, their their IQ tends to be lower. Their cognitive um, ability tends to be lower than your average person. So here's this lady. She's clearly got these facial characteristics. She's probably in her late 20s. She has a cut-off T-shirt with no bra on underneath. Now, can I say that she's being sexually explicit? No, I, I honestly don't think she knows any better. But she has two young children. Now. If she's not providing the care for these children that they need, is it intentional necessarily? No. Maybe completely unintentional, and she needs resources and support to be a, the parent she needs to be. She simply doesn't know any better. Okay, so let's not always be quick to say, ooh, they're bad parents. Let's look at, is there something else going on behind the picture, okay? The sexual abuse, I don't think I need to explain that, do I? Okay. 
as we progress through this, I'm going to reference a uh, movie. I'll, I'm just going to tell you, I'm not telling you to go watch it. I don't like movies that are depressing. I pay to be entertained. I don't want to walk out depressed. But I got so intrigued as I started watching the movie, I couldn't quit watching it. Monsters Ball with Halle Berry and Billy Bob Thornton. Okay, first of all, the language is despicable. <laughs> it's like, can y'all stop using those words? Because you can communicate just as effectively without all that. Um, but the, the movie has a lot of complex things going on there. But Halle Berry is a very abusive, emotionally abusive parent towards an obese child. And it makes me always think about this presentation here because the way she talks to the child and the way she treats the child is, is gut-wrenching, okay? I mean, she really, really, really emotionally abusive to this little boy. Um, we talked about all that, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we talked about the difference here, but don't forget, emotional abuse versus emotional neglect are completely different things. So what would be an example? Where are y'all signs at? Y'all just know I know your names down pat now? Oh, I'm trying, but I, don't, I, don't, I see no signs. Chelsea, you're the first one to put yours up. Chelsea, what? give me an example of a difference between emotional abuse and emotional neglect. What would be a difference between the two? I just how you upset or crying and not able to pay attention to those needs. Okay, so that would be emotional neglect. What would be an example, Dina, of emotional abuse? Um, screeching at the child, calling them names. Okay, like the Halle Berry movie. Like right. I was talking about, she, she's talking about how he's disgusting. She finds that he hid a bag of potato chips from her. He was snacking on potato chips when she wasn't looking, and then he hid them from her. She found them in the couch in this movie, and she lays into him. He's worthless. He's disgusting. She rep he repulses her. You know, blah blah blah. That is emotional abuse. Okay, so emotional neglect versus emotional abuse. Emotional neglect. Parents simply not there. Okay. Um, how do we know that emotional neglect? How does that affect the newborn? What does that result in often? Yeah, that, that detachment, what's it, what does it lead to? Failure thrive. to thrive in an infant. So even this little, brand new, psychologically immature being has a psyche, doesn't it? That is affected by emotional neglect. Powerful, isn't it? So don't forget, when we're talking about our children here, you know there's that old saying, you, you don't want to destroy the spirit of a child, okay? Who is that person inside? Um, physical abuse, again, now we're talking about something deliberate, the, the injuries don't match up with the story, blah, blah, blah. But let's talk about our legal responsibilities. Can Sydney document um, parent reports the child fell off the slide, but I don't think so. This isn't matching, you know? Because uh -uh, now she's made it subjective and personal. What can Sydney document instead? Parent states, quote, they fell off the slide, end quote. Then she documents the presence of her bruising. She had, uh, child has labial lacerations, perirectal bruising, inner, inner thigh. healing stages. That's right, healing and different. She's just being completely objective with exactly what she found on assessment. She's not drawing the correlation. She's saying the parent states this. Ooh, I'd love me some lace potato chips. Squirrel, sorry, that's my favorite. <laughs> my favorite. I got some at home I didn't open on purpose because that's what I'll do, I'll eat them. Okay, so we, she's simply stating facts. She's not drawing that correlation. She can't, can she? Because what happens to that chart? Back out the door it goes. Okay, and, and you've just hurt your victim. <coughs> You have to be completely objective with your findings. Now, when you're talking to a child, there are skilled people who will communicate with the child. Okay? When you're talking to an adult, and we're going to get there in a few minutes, you talk, you talk directly to the adult. But we report our findings, and we follow our chain of command, whether it be social services, our charge nurse, 
how soup, whoever it may be, you follow your chain of command and you report your discrepancies. Okay? But, so, Munchausen by proxy, have y'all heard of that? Yes. Okay, what is that? Whenever the parent makes the child believe that they're sick all the time and they take them And makes them sick. Okay, um, y'all watch Discovery Channel? I, I like this. Wasn't there this one lady who, like, cured her? Yes, yes. Yes, and that, yeah, yeah, forensic files does a lot of good stuff. Talk so this is true. Okay, Munchausen by proxy is a, is a okay. This isn't a type of abuse where the parent will willfully cause injury or harm to the child, because what happens is every time they take the child in for treatment, they're getting the attention they're looking for. Do y'all know who your primary occupation is among these people? Nurses. That's right. That is the truth. It's typically the female parent, and they're typically nurse. They're often nurses. They're very savvy. They know how to make these signs and symptoms be just enough that a provider is not going to poop them away and say, uh, "I better, you know, probably need to check into this." Okay? Yet they're very, very vague, non-specific, um, and unfortunately, the child is the one who suffers. Y'all watch um, Six Sense. Remember the little girl that reaches out to the boy her ghost does because her mama was poisoning her? You remember that? Okay, that's that classic uh, example of much house by proxy. So we've, we've got a parent who is intentionally making a child sick and the child needs to go under all kinds of diagnostics and the child unfortunately often will pass away. And medicine is, re is, ne is hesitant to say this isn't legit because why do we, we live in a day, day and age everyone wants to sue everybody. Right, so they're hesitant to say, I don't think this is what's going on. I think instead, this is a parent has an issue here, etc. Parents very won't leave the child's side. Why? They don't want the child telling anybody what's going on, if the child even knows. Okay, so Munchausen by proxy is one form of intentional physical abuse. So who are these people that abuse? Okay, I heard this profound statement. And I really, really, it's so true. Often, an abuser was abused. However, not all that have been abused become abusers. Y'all hear the clear? There's a big distinction between those two things. Often the people who abused were abused. But that does not mean that every abuser becomes, every abused person becomes an abuser. That's not true. Okay? So we look at those characteristics. These are people who have very low tolerance for stress. This is that person that calls 911 at McDonald's drive through because they put pickles and they ask for no pickles. <laughs> Y'all heard them. They're on the news. Right? Okay. Talk about a low stress tolerance. Right. Okay. We need, we, need to, we need to back up a little bit. Very low ability to tolerate stress. Um, poor coping skills with just life, just life as a whole. They, there's some, we're talking about some psychological, some biological, some sociocultural theories as well. Why do you think these characteristics would add to the likelihood of, a, of that child being abused? What is it about those characteristics that would increase the likelihood this child may be abused? They add extra levels of stress. Have you ever had to take care of a sick child? They, there's an extra level of stress in the home. A premature child is going to be a sickly child. A child with special needs is going to have a lot of extra care that's going to be required of them. Okay, and that adds to the stress level in the home. But don't forget that it can ha happen also among any socioeconomic class, even though we find that conditions of poverty can increase the likelihood of abuse. Why? Because we're increasing the likelihood of stress in the home. Substance abuse goes without saying. Okay? Um, but again, don't think that it doesn't happen among those of high social, uh, high income statuses. That's not true. We had an anesthesiologist right here in Dothan who was physically abusing his wife. He's no longer in Dothan. He's not in Alabama. But it happens, okay? Um, they also, you remember the old classic thing? A bully is someone with very low what? Self -esteem. Low self-esteem. And the only way to, to promote their own self-worth is to do what? To pick on or belittle others. Okay? So we have those same characteristics going through. Um, there's different types of sexual abuse. Big thing to remember about incest is incest does not have to be a blood relationship to be considered incest. It's simply a familial relationship. 
So it could be a step parent, for instance. And it's considered incest. So it doesn't have to have a blood relationship to be considered incest. Molestation, un unsolicited touching, exhibitionist, that's your, your boy, your stripper. Uh, what do you call those? With the, with the coats? There's a word. Streakers. <laughs> Try <to> find, <laughs> your streaker. <laughs> Try to find a word. Child pornography, um, y'all know what that is at this point, okay? The, the solicitation of electronic or picture media, etc. And then child prostitution. Unfortunately, often with your child prostitution, you'll find this in families where there's a significant substance abuse problem among the caretaker. And this is how they pay for their substance. Happens right here in this county. And then we have pedophilia, which is a whole other spectrum where this person actually develops a love in a sexual nature towards a child. Okay, we're not talking about a parental type love or social type love, but actual sex type love. So what do we need to do? Okay, upon assessment, we need to determine is this child in imminent danger? Let's look at our assessment. Do we have, the, the, does the story match up with the injury, et cetera, et cetera? And ascertaining very quickly, is this child going to be in an imminent danger? Because that's going to determine what we're going to do about it. If this is a situation where the family needs a lot of counseling, a lot of support, a lot of resources, then the child goes home with the family with direction towards resources and support. If this is a situation where a child's in imminent danger, it may be that the child needs to be removed from that situation immediately. Okay? So we look for it. Now, your job. And this is so important. Don't become the substitute parent. You know, you'll take care of patients that you just want to take home with you. You'll have, you'll encounter children that you just want to, you know, gosh, if I could just take them under my wing. Why can I not, there's two big reasons for that, but they all focus around one primary reason. Why can I not do that? Okay, let's do this example. I'm your educator. Why can I not invite you to my backyard barbecues and friend you on Facebook? Conflict, Conflict of interest because what happens as a, con as a consequence of that? Um, boundaries are blurred, but what happens when your boundaries are blurred? It affects your judgment. It affects your judgment and your care. You lose your objectivity. When you lose objectivity, you are no longer capable of providing the appropriate care. And these people are here to be taken care of by you. So that doesn't mean that I can't have emotions or that I can't think or that I can't want better for my, but I, I understand that line in the sand means I have to deliver competent care. That's not subjective. Because that's the way I'm going to take care of this person. Okay. Um, you actually can hurt the child when you try to take over that role. Okay. Confuses them. They don't understand why all of a sudden now you're not there. You, you simply can't do that. Okay. So we're going to look for what do we need to do to help this child. Um, elder abuse on the other end of the spectrum. Again, we have our vulnerable populations as we do even with pathophysiology disease processes, don't we? Vulnerable populations, the young, the old, the cognitively impaired. So with elder abuse, what happens? Well, give me an example of elder abuse. Brandy. Financial. Go ahead. Financial. Yes, and that, that happens very commonly. We have a patient who is living with their children. The patient isn't getting their their needs aren't being met, their medications aren't being purchased, whatever. But the family's using the medicines to go pay for, you know, weekend at the, at the lake. The money, rather. Okay? Financial abuse. Took, we, uh, when I used to take spectral care groups, we had a young man, and he, because of his cognitive and psychological problems, he, does not, he did not see that he was being abused by his sister financially. He received a stipend from the government. He received subsidized housing that he did not have to pay for, a one-bedroom apartment. But guess who slept in the bedroom? His sister and her boyfriend, who were both unemployed. Guess where he slept? On the floor, on a mattress pad. 
but he could not see how he was the victim of financial abuse here. That money was not meant to support sister and her boyfriend while they lived off of everybody else. Okay, so financial abuse, you know, looking into your, the, is the money that's being supplemented to this household to provide care for this person being used to provide care for that person. What about physical abuse? We've got bruises in places, again, we don't see. When you're dealing with the adult, you ask them point blank, Ms. Russo, is someone hurting you? Point blank. Now, HIPAA protects me from having the person in the room that's hurting her, right? Don't my HIPAA laws dictate that when you ask the patient the question, who can be in the room with you, is there supposed to be anybody else in the room when you ask that question? The answer is no, there's not supposed to be. How do you think about it? If my husband is at a doctor's office and they ask him and I'm sitting there, who can we share your private information with? Who do you think he's gonna say? Her. <laughs> You don't want to go home with me unhappy. <laughs> right? You don't. <laughs> but that's why those laws are there to protect them so that they can say, look, when she comes in here, you can pretend all you want to, but I don't want her to know anything about this. That's his right. So when, you, when you're doing, if you're following HIPAA laws the way they're supposed to be implemented, you ask the patient that question in the absence of any other person in the room with them so that they can truthfully and honestly say, please don't let my son be in here when you ask these questions. Now when the son's in the room, he doesn't have to know that she didn't give consent for him to hear. Can, can I ethically tell him? The answer is no, you don't say that at all, okay? That is her business or his business. You, you don't say, well, they didn't give me permission to tell you. Okay, but I can then ask those questions that I need to ask, who's hurting you, who are you afraid of? Okay. Dr. Radney had a situation where the patient was very forthcoming. She was being discharged, and she, she was terrified. And uh, when Dr. Radney said, who do I call to come pick you up? And she was terrified, and Dr. Radney just said, at point blank, she was, okay, talk to me. What's going on here? He is so mean to me when we get home, and he does this and this. And even on the phone conversation with him, he was not nice at all. And when he came up there, he was so hostile, even towards Dr. Radney, guess what she did? She canceled the discharge. <laughs> she said, not today. This isn't gonna happen. And then of course, followed the appropriate chain of command. Look, there, there is clearly some abuse going on here. I cannot let this patient go home in the hands of this individual. He's not even trying to hide how much hostility he has towards his mother. Okay? so. Safety, patient safety is what boards is always going back to, right? Because that's our primary responsibility. And again, the emotional abuse, similar to with the care, you know, we, you know, you're disgusting, you're sloppy, you're dirty, blah blah blah, you're useless, whatever. Okay. Rape can rape happen in a marital situation? Yes. Yes, yes because the bottom line is what? Consent. Consent. Okay. Now, um, we statistically have females outnumbering males, but does that mean that we think that's an accurate picture? No. Why do we think that that's probably skewed? Males, are males tend not to report. Okay. Um, unfortunately, many are someone they know. So different types, date rape. I told my daughter, okay, I'm not that stupid parent that thinks my children are perfect, okay? I think they're perfect in another regard, but I'm not dumb. And so I told my daughter when she went off to college, I said, I, don't tell me you're not going to parties because I'm not stupid. But I'm telling you this, don't you drink anything you didn't. Pour yourself or fix yourself. That is my one rule. Period end. Now, she ended up with a 4.0 from UAV. I would suggest that she probably wasn't partying too much. <laughs> but she had a goal in mind. She wanted to get into med school. But I wasn't stupid either. I know that there were some weekends where she was probably with some friends doing some things. I don't really know. But don't, why do we teach our children that? Protect Date rape. Them. Protect them from somebody adding something to their drink, okay? Um, marital rape, like we just talked about. Statutory rape, so different states have different numbers as far as when is it considered statutory rape for a young person to have a sexual relationship with someone. Does statutory rape mean that the other person said no? No. no, they may have, they may not have, okay? 
But typically in statutory rape, the person gives consent, but what is it, why is it as a state we step in and say, uh-uh, that was still rape? But what is it about that? That's true. So, Pierce, you guys are on the right page. When is your brain, by pathophysiology, truly mature? At what age? 25. That's why in some states, insurance rates go down, especially for boys, when they reach the age of 25. Driving insurance. Because they're we like, okay, their brain's a little more mature. They're not going to use every gallon of gasoline they got going from this gas light to that, that red light. You know how that is. You know, Whoa! <laughs> when you get the same red light, you're like, hey. <laughs> well, I said, you're going to get shot one day. <laughs> so probably so. <laughs> But I got more gas than he's got. <laughs> but, but we're saying that this person, due to their immaturity of their brain, the emotional immaturity of the individual, makes them incapable of understanding the long-term consequences of this action. And therefore, although they said yes, they weren't capable of saying yes. Okay, and that's why we look at statutory rape. So we've got different types of rape, and again, the, the age will vary based from state to state. So what is my job? Okay, follow your hospital policy to the very last period of every sentence. You cannot afford to not do this for the victim's sake. And think, just use critical thinking. You guys, if you drop a garment of the patients on the floor and then you pick it up to put it in an evidence bag, what's on that garment? Probably some of my DNA. This curly stuff falls out everywhere. My husband said, don't commit a crime. They'll find you because your hair's everywhere. Okay? It's going to pick up everything from the patient that was there before, the nurses, the staff. So how we handle the garments, how we handle the rape kit is very important. We, um, Sane and SART nurses, y'all you know what I'm talking about when I say Sane, sexual assault nurse examiners? Uh, Miss Tucker, just as a little trivia, is a former Sane nurse. Okay, this is what she did um, it, until it just got so hard for her to, to be on call for that and do her, her work in other, here and other places. Um, she just couldn't keep that up anymore. Okay, and then funding too. But how we handle that is very, very important. We have to be supportive to the victim and we talk to who the victim or the victim's sister is, mad as a hornet. The victim, the victim only. That's where we're going to gather our evidence from. Now the legal system will go through any witnesses or whatever, but you don't. You are speaking to the patient. Now we're going to be very supportive of this person because what has been taken away from them. Well, okay, first of all, let's go back to what do people rape? What it, rape is not an act of sexual gratification. Control. That's right. It is an act of control and dominance. So what have we taken away from them? Their control. So what do you think we need to try to restore? Control. Their sense of control of their own being, their own life. Okay? That is very important. This has just been robbed from them in a very violent manner. So we, we need to make sure we're helping them have that sense of control. Uh, we've got to think about long-term things. Emergency contraception, STD treatments. I mean, there's a, this isn't a done deal now. This can have consequences later. Psychological support later, okay? But legal matters is really important here as well. So we've got some different theories as to why people abuse biological, psychological. Biological, you know, like Adam Sandler's um, fight with the professor when I talk about the medulla oblongata. <laughs> <laughs> biological theories that some people lack inhibition, regret, you know, um, chemicals. Like, you know, okay, I know my clinical group told me, told me, heard me say this, but, you know, there's, I, I learned how to drive in Fort Worth, Texas, okay? And when you drive in Texas, if you're in the left lane blocking the flow of traffic, you're going to get a ticket. Because the left lane is not meant for traveling, it is for passing only. How many times do you see people ride the left lane? 
Oh my gosh. Okay. My inside voice says, I just want to pick their car up and move it out of my way. But I have inhibition that say, you can't do that. Just take a chill. But there are people, based on biological theories, that lack that inhibition because of their different chemistries in their brain, their organs, and function of their brain. Okay? And we have psychological theories. Were they abused? Were they brought up? You know, gosh, y'all, some people are raised in, in situations that you, you, you know that their chances of functioning in society are slim to none. Some horrific circumstances. Okay? So psychological theories. And then we have socio-cultural theories. There are some cultures that still practice female genitalia mutilation to this day. Is that not abuse? Yes, regardless of what your culture says, that is actual abuse. What about um, raping a virgin because this will help you cure yourself of AIDS? Okay, first of all, it's not true, but is it a cultural practice among some groups? It is. So we have to look at, were you gonna say something more? Yeah, I was going to say, I was watching a, a documentary one time about that in Africa. Yeah. And they said that the women would put razor blades in their Oh, God bless them. To protect themselves, like yeah. young girls. Kind of like we did back in the old medieval days when we had those um, chastity garments. Mm -hmm. Sad. But because this belief is prevalent among some cultural groups. Okay? So different theories as to why people would... Uh, be, be abusers. What can we do? Do we need imminent protection? Is this a crisis situation and this person needs to be removed from their current situation? Do we need to provide them a place that they can go to, not only remove them, but do we have some place we can send them? Is there some place they can go? And then it may be a situation where we simply need a lot of family therapy. How do we handle anger? or How do we handle, handle frustration? Are there some resources that we can give this family that might help them? Okay? So it depends on the situation at hand. Now, these childhood diagnoses, I hope that you kept your, your psych book because it does a really good job breaking these down. Um, a lot of these, the lines are kind of blurred. We're gonna hit the high points. Focusing on, okay, with any mental health disorder, what is your overarching goal? What is the big, big goal for Safe. any, huh? Safety. Okay, well, you're right. Get, into, <laughs> get them back into society. Yeah. I need a person to, to be functional. a functioning member of society. That's our, that's our giant goal. Now our imminent goal is safety. Are they safe today? Okay, that's, that's like right now, short term, we gotta make sure they're safe. But overall, our goal as a society for people with any mental health disorder is to help them become productive members of society with successful relationships. So when we're looking at these childhood characteristics, again, make sure you go through your, your um, PEDS book and your, I think in your psych book as well, I know it is look through these different disorders, okay? So ADD, ADHD, here, very prevalent in society today. Um, I forget the stats, I think it's one out of every nine, I can't remember. And they're not sure if it's because we've got more of an awareness of that, is that today, or is it something that's emerged with society, trends, who knows. But a lot of, again, same thing, biological and environmental. And here we have, when we talk about environmental, we're gonna talk about familial influences. And some of these things, it's going to be, for instance, who's the parent? Okay. Um, and then we got medicines here. So what are we, when we talk about our medicines, what do we know about stimulant medications? What effect do they have? What's a big common effect? What do they depress? Appetite. One of the common side effects of a stimulant drug is it suppresses appetite, which is why sometimes stimulant medications are used to treat people with elevated BMIs, even though they don't have ADHD. We're using it because of the side effect of the drug. So weight loss may be a little bit of a problem. Um, that would be a big thing I would pull out from there. Okay. Going to, I think, ODD, conduct disorder. Okay, so here we have 
So when do these things become a problem? Typically, a couple of criteria needs to be met for any mental health disorder, okay? Duration of greater than six months, this can't be a random thing, is interfering with either the rights of society or the health or well-being of the individual or others around them. So when we're looking at a conduct disorder, we're talking about a, a behavior that violates the rights of others. Okay, the societal norms are what we expect in a society is not being followed. Okay, whereas, well, yeah, yeah, I'm going through this again. Peer relationships, family influences, who's the parent, and you know, we, we look at genetics as a potential role. The temperament of the child. We all know everybody's got a different temperament, don't they? I have two children. They both have very different temperaments. Okay. Um, so is that, that, that intrinsic temperament of that child, and of course biochemical, that goes back to your serotonin, your dopamine, all these things. Whereas oppositional defiant, the big characteristic difference between these two is oppositional defiant is specifically targeting people in authority positions. They don't accept authority at all. So this is your child that when they're in school, it's not just their peers they are lashing at it, whatever, they're, it's their teachers, their um, group leaders, whatever it may be. I mean, we're talking about over the top, like throwing a chair at a teacher. I knew of a five-year-old that threw a chair at a teacher. I mean, just really, really over the top behavior. Same thing though, same family influences, biochemical influences, what have you. Obesity, so we ask ourselves, why would obesity be under a mental health disorder? Because what is it that we have learned through research that we commonly see associated with obesity? What do people, why do people overeat? Love and nurturance is one of the number one reasons. Because it, you know, certain things release certain chemicals in your brain and make you feel better. I mean, I don't know about you, but I love it all French fries. Right? <laughs> but in a serious manner, they really do promote that feeling of feeling good. Okay? Love and nurturance is one of the things we look at when we talk about overeating. That doesn't mean that people who overeat are necessarily mentally ill. Okay? But why are we as health care providers concerned about people with elevated BMIs? puts you at such high risk for so many comorbidities, the primaries being diabetes, hypertension. And we know diabetes and hypertension is a nasty combination that leads to renal disease, cardiovascular disease, cerebral vascular disease. So when we're talking to our patients, we're looking at health, not looks. It's not about looks, it's about health. A BMI of what, greater than what, is considered overweight. 25. A BMI greater than 25 is considered overweight. And the higher the BMI, the higher the likelihood of these comorbidities. So what we've known as a society, based on research, is if we can keep BMIs healthy, we're going to lower the incidences of hypertension, diabetes, etc. Now, I'm not going to test you on any of this stuff. I just want you to understand why do we theorize that people tend to overeat. Okay. Um, I will not test you on bariatric surgery. You had that 105. We're not revisiting that on this test. Moving along. But I do want you to talk about some of your meds. Remember that medications, I just said a minute ago, sometimes we use certain medications not because that person has, okay, let's do um, gabapentin. We know gabapentin is a drug that's very good, uh, uh, has been used to treat, for instance, a seizure disorder. Why then would you might see a patient prescribe gabapentin who has never had a seizure in their life? Because of neuropathies, we also found out that, hey, this does this. So sometimes medications aren't used for their primary purpose. They're used for the side effect of the purpose, like we talked about beta blockers in Module A. You, it's not at all unusual to see beta blockers prescribed to a patient who is not hypertensive and is not tachycardic, but who has ischemic-induced arrhythmias. Because when we lower the heart rate, lower the force of the contraction, we lower the likelihood of an ischemic-induced arrhythmia. Okay, so sometimes our medicines are used because of the other 
effect they have. <coughs> so again, you might see medications used to treat depression. Maybe this patient is eating when they're sad or blue or feel sad or blue, okay? Maybe we need to treat the underlying cause. That might treat the problem. Or they're because they're stimulants, they depress appetites naturally. Have you ever drank a, how many of you guys like coffee? That's my, that's my line in the sand. I will never give it up, period, in, done. Not talking about it. Dr. Rand tried to get me fast. He's like, that was it. I'm not giving that up. And I like, I like my frou-frou coffee. She said, well, just drink it black. I said, hey, no. <laughs> okay. When you drink a cup of coffee, do you get hungry afterwards? No. It's an awesome appetite suppressant because it's a stimulant effect. Okay. So the stimulant effects of some of these drugs suppress appetite, and therefore they're very useful. If I were you, I would make sure I know my patient teaching that I would need to include, okay? And if you listen carefully to Ms. Lay, she'll point out some things to you. So again, assessment, and we're, remember, this is not about looks, this is not about, the last thing I'm going to do is make a person feel less self-worth. Your self-worth is not, would you like to know that your self-worth is based on your exam grades? No, I'm more than my exam grade, right? I'm more than a number. So our patients don't need to feel like they're not worthy or don't deserve the same dignity and respect as any other patient. So when we're talking to people with patients where we need to work on their BMI, our focus and the word we're going to use is health. Okay? Let's get you to a healthy place. Because the last thing you want to do is tear somebody's self-worth down. That's not going to help us at all. So BMI is, a, is our standardized way of approaching this. And then, you know, you may have, like Mr. Money was talking about a friend of his that's a bodybuilder. Well, his BMI is not normal, but he has virtually non-existent body fat. So for a patient of that nature, we would use a body fat analysis to determine, okay, what would be, um, where are they at in terms of health. Okay, um, so again, identification of where the overeating begins, what's the trigger, helping your patients identify their trigger to overeat, um, and working with them, maybe they need some group therapy, maybe they need individual counseling, just some self-awareness on what their goals are. And we set realistic goals. Why do we not set unrealistic goals? What happens? That's right, when you don't meet an unrealistic goal, you set yourself up for failure. And we want small increments. Wouldn't it be nice if honestly you could just one day like eat really, really healthy and the next day you're like, man, 10 pounds, that's, a, that's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> we want that instant gratification, don't we? But persistence and due diligence and realistic weekly goals help your patient achieve their long-term goals, okay? Oh, opposite end of the spectrum, we have anorexia nervosa, and here we have a body image distortion. The person sees themselves <coughs> in a different way. They tend to be perfectionists, high achievers, often were victims of sexual abuse. Again, don't look at every anorexic patient and say, oh, they were abused. You don't know that, but they were statistically frequently victims of sexual abuse. So we have anorexia nervosa, a person's absolute fear of becoming overweight, and they see themselves in a dysmorphic manner. But I'm looking at this from a nursing perspective. What am I worried about with this person with this profound nutritional and hydration deficit? What am I worried about? Heart, heart, heart issues? What kind of cardiovascular issues? What's missing? I don't want to go to the next slide. I think it's on there. What's missing? Okay, think about it. If you've got a nutritionally deprived person, what can they be predisposed to? Remember your electrolytes. Cardiac dysrhythmias is a number one. Okay, so they are at high risk for lethal arrhythmias. They're high risk for orthostatic hypotension. Hypotension is, a, as a general rule, why? Because there, there's no there's very little volume. So as a nurse, I'm looking at the safety implications associated with that. Let's see if I got there. 
UTIs, frequent UTIs. So again, I've got an anorexic patient. What am I going to do? I'm going to make sure they're monitored. And if I don't have an order for telemetry, what am I going to do? I'm going to call and ask for one. Because I understand as a nurse, this is a priority. This patient's going to be a fall risk for me. Nobody had to tell me that. I already know this patient is, is going to be orthostatic most likely. Why would I take the chance? Let's go ahead and make them a fall risk and be done with it. We know this person is at high risk, okay? I'll get back to this in a second. So, again, we're really not 100% sure societal influences to be thin. We're doing better today than we were even 10 years ago, aren't we? We're doing better, okay? Um, we've still got some room to grow, but it's not like it was, I would say in the 70s, it was really bad. Um, 80s, those ears were probably some of the worst. But we've gotten better as we've gone through the decades, um, not looking at beauty being associated with a low BMI. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, very low success rate in our treatment of this patient. I, I can vividly recall two particular patients. Well, actually, one was a person I knew in society. The other one was a patient. One in society, um, I actually had to help her undress. This is when I was in nursing school and I was working in a clothing retail and she needed some help because she was so weak. And I will never forget seeing her ischial spine I thought, through her underwear. I thought, are you kidding me? She has no, no, oh, so sad to me. Um, it, it was shocking. Her jaw protruded so much. Her scapula, it was shocking. Um, she's much healthier today. I still see her from time to time, much healthier today. And then one was a patient. I had a group of students, and this lady was a highly educated lady. She was actually a school teacher, um, very successful, and came in because she had passed out. Well. She weighed 76 pounds when we got her. And um, we got an order to put a feeding tube down her, which she had refused repeatedly. So they made her a ward of the state. The state takes over and says, you are not in a situation to be able to take and make those decisions. We are making them for you now. And the feeding tube's going down. So my poor student looked at me like, I was like, yeah, we're gonna go do it. And it, it was, again, good learning <coughs> for the student, unfortunately for the lady. Very firm, okay, the tube's going down. I don't need to restrain you. I'm not, you know, we don't threaten patients, okay? I'm gonna ask for your cooperation. We'll get this down very quickly, it'll be done, and, and we'll move on. And she did, now she cried the whole time, and she cried afterwards, and then afterwards she was sent to a place outside of Birmingham that specializes in the treatment of these patients. So supportive but firm. This isn't an option anymore. You know, Dr. Neil and I, when we take fundamental students in there, they come out, they didn't want their bath. <laughs> <laughs> what did I just tell you? You don't ask. They didn't want me to assess them. You don't ask. <laughs> you have, go back in there. Come on, I'll go with you. And I'll go in there, We're, I, you know. No, this isn't optional. We've got, you have to do this. This isn't, you don't ask. You ask a three-year-old if they want to go potty. No, they're busy playing. They'll rip their bridges instead, okay? No. So, supportive but firm, okay? Because our goal, again, is to optimize the patient's health. And this patient's in a, in a psychiatric state that they're not capable to make those decisions anymore regarding their care. Bulimia. Here we have a patient <coughs> who's doing what instead? As opposed to not consuming enough, they are overheating. They're purging. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind is your patient who's bulimic often has a normal BMI. Don't look at this person as being anorexic. By the way, what does the A stand for in anorexia? Without, Without appetite. Okay. So, couldn't I say that my patient who's getting chemotherapy is anorexic? Yeah, but that's not the psychological disorder because what's the psychological disorder? Anorexia nervosa. Don't confuse them. Okay, we can describe the patient as being anorexic. We're just simply saying they have no appetite. Okay. 
Um, this patient instead vomits or uses laxatives, okay? How, what's the characteristic on your assessment findings that you'll typically see? Increase their teeth are in bad shape. Okay, look like people using meth. Okay, that's one of their usual giveaways. Again, we need to look at the safety of the patient. Are we um, compromising fluid and electrolytes? Okay, so again, cardiac complications, behavior therapy, etc. Now, this is not a psychological disorder. Okay, but it's in this module. We didn't ask for it to be put there, it just is. But mental retardation, there's different forms of mental retardation. We have Down syndrome, we have children who had hypoxic injuries prior to birth or during birth. You know, there's, and we've had fetal alcohol syndrome, so there's lots of different types of mental retardation. So what we're saying is the person's not progressing mentally like they should, okay? Some have distinct characteristics, like your Down syndrome baby has very distinct facial characteristics. And then some will be less obvious. And so how would we know that the baby is not developing cognitively as they should because of the benchmarks that we have in place? When they roll over, when they sit up, okay? Is this baby making poor eye contact when they eat? Is it fussy, 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 can't get the baby settled? Is it not interactive, okay? So different little things that we look at to ascertain, do we have a cognitive impairment? The big thing about everything I go through here is it is impossible for us to implement help if we don't identify. So you've got to go through that assessment. And again, that's what those benchmarks or milestones are there for, is so we know based on normal cognitive development, based on normal physical development, these things should be met at such times. And when they're not, what's going on? Or if there's a behavior that's aberrant to the normal, what's going on there, okay? Because the earlier we can identify it, the earlier we can implement intervention. That is our key to success here. My cousin Christy has Down syndrome. Um, it was not a maternal age related issue. My aunt was 26 when she had her, so it wasn't she had, you know, aging over or anything like that. It was a true genetic tendency. My Anna, the daughter I told you I had between my two children, would have had she survived Survived, have profound, there's different levels of Down syndrome, she would not have been bowel or bladder trainable had she survived. We've got different levels. My cousin Christy is very optimal, high functioning. Um, Christy's hardest thing was when we went from rotary phones to push button phones, she had a little bit of a hard time with that. My aunt and uncle always taught her how to dial 911. She operates a cell phone now, FaceTime people. Okay, she's definitely high functioning, but she had early intervention. How many have you seen agencies who employ people who have mental retardation? There's a little groundskeeper at Flowers Hospital. He is like that Energizer Bunny. Mm -hmm. I have seen him out there in the sweltering heat. I've seen him out there in the cold. I've seen him in the rain. I'm thinking, he doesn't stop. He's a, one of the best employees they'll ever have as far as their groundskeeper, hired through Wiregrass Rehab Center. Now, he's a little Trojan. You know who I'm talking about, Mr. Money, I bet. Mm -hmm. He does an amazing job. Why can't they hold down jobs? Why can't they? But again, it becomes that early intervention. Are we doing what we can to help this person? Because what's the overarching goal? We want people more functioning members of society with relationships. How many of you seen the little girl that's Down syndrome that's got is a model? A little blonde head little girl? Actually, she's done a little bit of acting on the side. Okay, so that leads us to some ethical questions. Who are we to say as a society that they can't have children or that they shouldn't be married. Do we have that right? No. These are ethical questions, okay? You think, why couldn't they have a healthy relationship as long as they had the support they needed for the safety of the child? And just because the parent has Down syndrome doesn't mean that the child will. So why can't they? Who are we to say that they can't? Okay, now again, that goes again with your when you look at ethics and morals, what's the level of functionality here? My Anna, I would have had, most likely had a hysterectomy at a very young age because she would have been incapable of consenting, okay? And that would have been for her own safety. But that's a different situation, isn't it? So when you look at the different levels of functioning, our goal is to, what can we do to optimize this person's quality of life and have them become a productive citizen society. 
So the earlier we detect alterations, the earlier we can promote and implement interventions. Okay, switching gears again. Now we're going to these odd eccentric personality disorders. We're going to go through several of these. Most of them, I think, are straight up. You can read it and know what you got, what you're dealing with. Paranoid personality disorder. Who's that person? That's the nursing student. Thinks everybody's out playing. <laughs> that is so not true. No member of faculty sits around and plots how they can face the play. That is utter nonsense. But who's the patient that's paranoid? Who are they? What's that pill you're giving me? Would you just put my IV? They're talking about me out there. Okay? Paranoid personality. Schizoid and schizotypal, they're a little bit different, not much. Um, you've got your Social withdrawal versus someone who's aloof. What is that? What is okay? What does aloof mean? Unaware. Okay. Whereas you're socially withdrawn, there's an intent. There's a staying back from people. Okay. Um, again, this lady does a really nice job going through these. There's some little character caricatures in here to kind of help you organize who's different in what way they're different. Um, your antisocial, that's Hannibal Lecter, a complete disregard for others and the well-being of others. I'm going to do this because this is what I want to do. I don't care what impact it has on you. I don't care if it violates your rights. I don't care if it causes you injury or harm. It's what I want. Okay, so that's your antisocial. Borderline personality disorder, that's Julia Roberts in her Runaway Bride movie. She really didn't know who she was. Did y'all ever watch that movie? Okay, borderline, she, I forget how many weddings she ditched. I don't remember. But what she came to find out in the end is she didn't even know who she was. The only, that when, when people would ask her what kind of eggs she liked, she would like whatever her fiance liked. She really never knew what she liked. So one fiance was scrambled, one it was eggs benedict, whatever. She didn't, so, in a, there, there's this inability to maintain a relationship because of their own inability to know who they are. Okay, we're going to expand on that. Now, histrionic, that over the top, sexually overt, way too much cleavage, way too much makeup, etc. And then you've got your narcissist. Who's your narcissist? Huh? It's okay, it's okay. I had some students one time say an actor it was hilarious. I was like, yeah, I'll probably say uh, a, a certain singer. <laughs> I won't wear Narcissist is that godlike complex. That's that nurse that, when I leave here, this hospital will collapse. Not likely, <laughs> but you go on with your bad self. We won't miss you. Okay, narcissist, in a, incapable of regarding the contributions of another is your narcissist. Now. As we're looking at these different personality disorders, I need you to be thinking about what would be your goal. How would you know the goal was attained? Think about that as you're studying and preparing for this person. Use the nursing process. What would be appropriate goals and outcomes? How would you know we met those things? So here's just some other things that remind you of your different disorders. See this person, um, unstable self-image, you know, um, fears, abandonment, that's why they like everything the other person likes, okay? There's your history on it. Um, if we had time, I'd tell you about a hilarious inter uh, interaction my husband had one time with somebody said, honey, just move on. Narcissist, well, there's some research that indicates that we're living in a culture now that's promoting narcissism. Mm -hmm. You ever see those people that do the selfie syndrome all the time? And they got that classic duck face. <laughs> <laughs> what is up with that? I get I, this is why I'm off social media. If y'all try to friend me after you graduate, don't get hurt if I don't respond because I, I haven't logged in since I think 2018. I, I do not have time for that. But all I ever saw from some family, it, family never mind. I thought, stop! You don't even look normal. But we're we're looking at research that suggests that we are promoting a narcissistic society through this. Your avoidant personality disorder, this is a person who, because they are so petrified of being hurt, will not engage in relationships. 
your dependent personality disorder, very frustrating patient to take care of because they perceive that they are incapable of doing anything for themselves. Again, you have to be the professional and rise above. We don't treat them in a bad manner. Obsessive compulsive, we joke about this a lot in our society. We say we're OCD, but again, going back to the criteria for when is it really OCD, what is it? Six months or more pervasive behavior interferes with the rights of them or their others. These are people, in other words, that can't keep their jobs because they went back to their house 15 times to make sure the microwave wasn't going off or whatever, okay? And it doesn't have to be actions with OCD. It can be thoughts, pervasive thoughts that interfere with their life, okay, or the lives of others. Paraphilias, we're almost done, guys. Paraphilias are um, interesting. Again, if you've ever watched the Discovery Channel, you'll they'll talk about this from time to time. So there's some criteria here, and there's three specific criteria that you absolutely have to understand. It can involve non-human objects. You can have it where it's real or simulated suffering and then repetitive action with non-consenting partners. So let's go through some examples here. On the, I think it was a Discovery Channel, the Learning Channel, there was a gentleman that they did a study on, a documentary on, that was in love with his car. Now I don't mean, man, that thing's pretty and I like that new car smell. I mean, <laughs> in his brain, and again, I'm, now please know, we're not making fun of people. Okay, at all, but we also understand this is definitely an aberration from normal. So when I say this, I'm not I'm not trying to be funny, but he actually had a sexual relationship with his car. Don't ask me how. I don't know. I'm just saying this is true. <laughs> he, he they interviewed him and he actually perceived this car as a personification and was in a love relationship with the car. <coughs> Um, Non-consenting partner. So this is where you know you're in an elevator and someone rubs up against your breast, accidentally. Okay, things like that. That would be those. That's considered a paraphilia. And then real or simulated suffering or humiliation. This is our sadist masochist behavior. So if we go through, here's just some more breakdown here. We talked about exhibitionists already. A fetish, you know, again, we use this term, you know, we've got a fetish for shoes, but we really don't have a fetish. We like them. The fetish becomes when there's a sexual connotation to that. Okay? So this is when it becomes a fetish. Fraud is that one that touches the people who aren't consenting for that. We talked about pedophile. Masochist, sadist, needs to be hurt, does the hurting, and then the voyeurs are people tell them. But again, we look at what's normal behavior versus what's aberrant behavior. Just because a, a, you know, we got this really hot girl who's moved in next door from college and at eight o'clock she's gonna undress in front of the window and that 16 year old boy next year is waiting for that to happen, that's not a, that's not a, a voyeur, okay? Um, a voyeur would be someone who seeks out and infringes on the rights of others, invades their privacy, their home, video cameras, etc. okay? Like the video cameras installed in the bathrooms, dressing rooms, that's what we're talking about there, okay? Boy. All right, now, again, I told you, as you're thinking of caring for your population here, like for instance, the narcissist, we know that one of the characteristics of a narcissist is that they're incapable of recognizing the contributions of others. Wouldn't it be profound if a narcissist thanked someone for their contribution to the team? Would that not be an indicator that we are making some strides towards that goal? If I've got a dependent personality disorder patient who changes their own colostomy bag, would that not be an indicator that we are making strides? What about your antisocial who recognizes the impact they had on that person's life when they did X? Okay. So, in dealing with your mentally ill patient, it's, it's um, they're not the same thing, so don't, don't put these together, don't say I said something I said, I didn't say. It's like, when you're dealing with a substance abuse patient, they can be mentally exhausting patients to take care of. They will drain the life out of you. But you have to be the professional, you have to rise above, and you provide them care with dignity, as you would any other patient, correct? When you're dealing with a mentally ill patient, it can be 
infuriating and exhausting. So nurses need safe places too, which is one of the things we're talking about. Don't I need some place to voice my own frustrations and stressors that's safe as a nurse? Yeah, because I'm going to be better when I can get it off my chest and move on. So we need safe places for our own discussions. It's not out in society. It's not out at the restaurant. Sometimes we need our own debriefing moments to de-stress and vent. In a safe environment where it goes no further, it's with the people who also take care of that patient. So it's not out in society infringing anybody's private rights, okay? So don't forget to, to we have to take care of the staff as well. Treatment can be very challenging because it's often difficult to have a mentally ill person recognize that they are the ones with the illness, not society. Okay, think about your paranoid person. They have a major distrust of everyone around them, so trying to get them to understand, no, this isn't the problem, here's the problem. Okay, so it's hard to work with those patients because it's hard for them to see that. Because why? Because their, their thought processes aren't working like they should be. So again, empathy, patience, kindness, dignity is imperative. And we usually use a multimodal approach. What do I mean by multimodal? Not just one thing. So we're not just going to use pharmacology, we're not just going to use group or individual, we're going to use a multimodal approach to help these patient, patients realize their best self. Okay? Um, so, preparation for Module G, remember Module G content is on Module B test. As you've already known, there is no um, ATI stuff with Module G, okay? Your ATI is going to be with Module B. But, make sure you're looking through your pharmacology, that you, you know, how would I teach a patient with these types of, and do it by classification, don't, don't, by classification of drug, is there something I would need to teach this patient or the caregiver of the person receiving this medication? Okay? Use the nursing process as you go through these disorders. What would you find on assessment? What would be your typical finding on assessment? What is our priority for that individual? Is it not to violate the rights of others or is it to promote their own self-worth being? What is it? Because once we identify that, we know what goals we would set for the patient. We would know how we're going to get there through our interventions. And then most importantly, how would we evaluate those were, if they were effective. Okay. Um, again, don't forget to think about your staff. We had a patient, it's, it's been quite some time ago, I remember, but she was nearly crippled with her rheumatoid arthritis. And the entire time we would see her on a weekly basis, it was exhausting because that's, she would just go on and on about her state. Well, that's our job, right, to be there for them. But it's mentally straining because you are a human being too, so we intentionally would alternate staff. Why do we do that? Not for us. Why do we do that? Why do we alternate staff to take care of her? For whose benefit? For hers. So that when that person went in there, they would be able to be therapeutic, patient, and kind. Because that's what they deserve. Okay? And that's what they need. But you're a human being, and so we recognize the limitations of a human being. And at what point do we need, when are we being therapeutic? Okay? Because at no point is it acceptable to not be, is it? At no point is it acceptable to be unethical or amoral. Okay? All right, so watch the little thing between now and Thursday morning, but most importantly, between now and Thursday morning, go over your A and P of the pulmonary system. Make sure you review ABGs. ABGs are on this test. I do not reteach ABGs. You had that 105, you need to pull it forward. Um, we'll go over, there's a really good link in the course, and that YouTube video still worked on how to quickly interpret ABGs. I would suggest you watch, it's like 11 minutes long. Okay, um, there are ABGs on this test. Any questions for Lechonka? All right, y'all have a good day.